whether it was because they were shy or because reading didn't come as easily to them as it did to me. But for whatever reason, this would bring out the absolute worst in me. I became impatient. I developed an attitude of superiority. I judged them and condemned them. And what I thought was me being nice and offering to read for them really was just me being a jerk. Listening was not my strong suit. Now, maybe that was the byproduct of being an only child who didn't have to wait for siblings to finish talking. Or maybe it was that I was always told by the adults around me how precocious I was and how bright and how... So I just thought I had all the wisdom in the world and I might as well share it with everybody. Whatever it was that led me to want to be the one speaking and never the one listening, that was a terrible way to be. It was a harmful way to be, not only for those around me, but for me. It wasn't until I was an adult that I truly learned to listen and to value real, true listening. Sometimes I wish I could go back to those elementary school days knowing as I do now how important it is to listen, to see what I could learn that I failed to learn because I was too busy running my mouth. I wonder when it was in James's life that he learned this lesson. We begin our reading today with James telling us, be quick to listen, slow to speak. Slow to anger. At the point of James writing this letter, he's learned the lesson that it took me so long to learn. Be quick to listen and slow to speak. Man, did I have that backwards for a big part of my life. But what James doesn't list, at least not right away, is to whom or to what we should be listening My microphone's falling off. Bear with me here a sec. Now, James does get to the point of to whom we're to listen by the time we get to verse 22, where he writes, be doers of the word, not merely hearers. So we are to listen to the word of God, but we have to do more than just listen. I think it's pretty significantly Uh, culturally significant here to note that at the time James is writing this particular passage that the only way the vast majority of people have to get the word of God is to hear it read. Somewhere between 97 and 99 percent of the population was illiterate. They couldn't read. Bible scriptures were not mass printed and, and produced like they are now. So they had to listen to the word of God. But they had to do more. So first we need to hush up enough to hear it. But then we have to be moved to action. Now this brings me back to that song for My Fair Lady again. Now of course the song in in the musical is between a man and a woman. uh, The guy is wooing the young lady. You know, so it's about romantic love, but I think bits and pieces of it can apply to our our Christian love as well. And and she in the in the song it says, um, "Don't talk of love lasting through time. Make me no undying vow. Show me now." She's tired of all the fancy words. Show her that you love her. Well, James tells us that all of the listening to the word is pointless if it doesn't lead us to action. God's word should not only motivate us, it should transform us. But James doesn't stop with just this generic call to do something. He gets rather specific. Now, I should warn you here that by the time we're done with James, you're either going to love him or hate him because he doesn't pull any punches. Now here, 
In verse 27, he says, religion that is pure and undefiled before, the God, before God the Father is this, to care for the orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. So let's take those two pieces separately. First, he says, care for the orphans and widows. Now, the Greek word that, that is used here for care does not describe a state of heart and mind. Like, aw, oh, I care about you, Mary. It is more an action word. It is a verb. We are to serve those in distress. The verb harkens back to Matthew 25 that we talk to the kids about, that we see around us here in the sanctuary. To care is to feed, to clothe, to nurture, to, nurture, to mourn with, to give to. In other words, to care is to serve. And while James specifically lists orphans and widows as the recipients of our care, he does so because culturally, at his time, those would have been the most vulnerable people in the society. That doesn't mean we should only care for widows and orphans and nobody else. It's telling us we should care for anyone who is vulnerable. To serve all of those in need who are within our sphere. It makes us think, who is it that is around us that is vulnerable? Who are we being called to serve? But then we get to that second part of James's definition of pure religion. In addition to serving the vulnerable, he says that we are to keep ourselves unstained by the world. What does he mean? How do we stay unstained from the mud and the filth and the muck of this world? Especially in a world that seems like day by day by day, there's more mud slinging, more filth, more muck that gets tossed around. How do we keep ourselves unstained by it? I think he gave us the answer way back at the beginning of our passage today. He tells us right after he says, hush up and listen and cool your jets, don't get so angry. He wrote, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. He likes to talk. I, I, I relate to James here a little bit. There's a lot of words there, but he says a lot in that one sentence. So let's break it down. Rid yourselves of all sordidness. Now, I don't know about you, but sordid is not a word that I use an awful lot. I mean, I hear it occasionally. So, like I do with words that I don't fully grasp, I looked it up. Sordidness is anything that is immoral or ignoble. If it isn't moral, if it isn't noble, it is sordid. So rid yourselves of anything immoral or ignoble, as well as any rank growth of wickedness. Now, rank growth struck me as an unusual phrase and one that we don't use a lot. So again, I looked it up. And in regards to growth, when we see the word rank, it doesn't mean smelly. It doesn't mean a certain office, you know, what is your rank in the military? It means growth that is thick and coarse and overgrown. We cut down some lilac bushes at our cabin a couple weeks ago that the branches were about this thick. You think those were overgrown? <laughs> it was rank growth. So how do we rid ourselves of rank growth of wickedness within us? We don't like to think of ourselves as wicked, do we? But we have to acknowledge that there's something there. We are all sinners who stand in the need of grace. We all have wickedness within us. And if we don't trim it, 
we don't cut it back, it grows and it grows and it grows until it is rank growth. So how do we get rid of that? How do we trim back? How do we prune the garden of our souls? Well, James again tells us, thank goodness. He says, welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. All of that sordidness, all of that wickedness is overcome by meekly, humbly welcoming the word of God that has already been implanted in you. The word that has the power to save, the word that can truly set us free is already within us. It is already fixed within us. The word that says you are are my beloved. The word that says you are forgiven. The word that says you have been set free of the bondage of sin and death so that by reflecting the love of God out into the world, you can help set others free as well. That word is grace. That word is mercy. That word is love. And it is the only word that can truly set us free. The last two verses that we read today sum it up for us. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. The law of liberty. I was struck by that phrase. We're hearing a lot about liberty right now in our culture, in our society. But you know, I think as Americans, we kind of mess this one up. James is not saying that we are to live under the law of doing whatever we please. Rather, we live under the law of love. The liberty is to break with the sinful ways of the world and become more Christ-like. The liberty is freedom from selfishness, greed, idolatry, all things that point us inward. All things that hearken back to that very first sin in the garden where the fruit was eaten, eaten so that they could become like God. But we are not like God. So let us not be so focused inward. We have been set free from that inward focus in order that we can focus outward and upward. Freedom to worship God, freedom to serve others, freedom to live in a state of love, to work for justice and to show mercy not only to ourselves, but to others. For James reminds us that judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. So often we are so quick to judge and so slow to be merciful. Who do you need to show mercy to today? Who have you been judging who would be better served by your mercy? Mercy does indeed triumph over judgment. Let that be the word that frees us today. Let us be free from being the judge of our brothers and sisters, of our neighbors, of our friends, and of our enemies. Let us be merciful as God has been merciful to us, then we will truly be free. Amen. As we move into our prayer time, I have a few that I want to lift up, and I see Joe's coming. We must have had some come in online. Um... I I said it at the top of our service, but I want to say it again. We continue to hold uh, Laura and Laverta in our thoughts and prayers. Um, 
We had a beautiful celebration of life here for Gerald on Thursday. And I'm so glad to see them surrounded by friends and family. And so um, we just continue to hold you in prayer. Um, I got a message from Paula Schwartz. Her little granddaughter, Vivian, choked on a piece of pizza the other day. And even though mom's a nurse, mom could not get that piece of food out. Thankfully, they're only three blocks from the fire department, and the paramedics were able to get that piece of food out, and Vivian is okay. But thanks be to God for watching out for that precious little girl. Thanks be to God for our first responders. Um, something so <laughs> seemingly easy as eating a piece of pizza could have been a very scary event for them. So we give thanks that the Lord was watching out for Vivian. Uh, Alona Llewellyn let me know this morning that her brother Virgil has passed away. And so, Alona, we hold you and your entire family in, in our prayers. Um, he'd been ill for a while, hadn't he? Um, and so he's released from that. He is set free. Um, and while we rejoice for the end of his suffering, we do mourn with you his passing. Uh, Ruby also list, lifted up that Amy Hurdle had some heart surgery, um, and it sounds like she's had quite a battle with health in her life, and so we pray for Amy during this time. Del Van Zee had his surgery this week. Um, I did get a message from Ginger that uh, he was recuperating and doing well, um, so we give thanks to God that Dell pulled through that surgery, and we just pray for his recovery and, and for regaining his strength. Prayers for the families of Jack Euphin and Mary Johnson as well. And prayers for all of those who are dealing with COVID-19. Um, we've had uh, quite a spike in numbers here in Hand County during the course of this week. Um, and so we pray for those in our congregation who have been diagnosed, um, but also all in our communities, in our families, in our country, in this world, who are being um, affected by COVID-19, whether they are currently positive or on the road to recovery. Um, this is a crazy time for all of us, and we just pray <laughs> for healing. We pray for wholeness, for for all of those affected. And we pray for safety for all. Um, may we do what we can to, to protect one another and ourselves in this time. Are there other joys or concerns that you would lift up today? If not, I would invite you into a time of silent prayer, and then I'll guide us through the remainder of our prayer time. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you today seeking to be people who do your will, not simply as those who say the right things. Help us to be bringers of peace, hope, healing, and love. We have lifted up in prayer, either aloud or in the depths of our hearts, those who need your presence and your touch. We know that you will be with those in need. But now give us the strength to rise up from our prayers and to be people of action, bringing comfort where we can, giving hope to those in need of it, being a presence of peace to those in turmoil, being representatives of your love in action. We pray this as we pray together as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is entitled, When the Church of Jesus... When the church of Jesus shuts its outer door, lest the roar of traffic drown the voice of prayer, may our prayers, Lord, make us ten times more aware that the world we banish is our Christian care. If our hearts are lifted where devotion soars high above this hungry, suffering world of ours, lest our hymns should drug us to forget its needs. Forge our Christian worship into Christian deeds. Lest the gifts we offer, money, talents, time, serve to salve our conscience to our secret shame. Lord, reprove, inspire us by the way you give. Teach us, dying Savior, how true Christians live. Friends, receive the benediction. May we all, as we go from this place, attune our hearts to hear God speak to us and then follow to do his will we cannot just simply say the right words. We must incorporate those words into our thoughts, into our actions, into every moment of our lives. Let us not be those who simply hear. May we be Christians who love. Go in peace. Amen.